morning, folks. Good to see you out this morning. It's a beautiful morning outside today. It's been nice over the weekend, so it's great to, to have a bit of sunshine and on our very, very mixed weather. So it's good to see you out this morning. And if you're visiting with us this morning, uh, we're delighted to see you. And um, just remind you, there is a tea, cup of tea and a cup of coffee afterwards. And so please don't, don't rush away. I do have one or two announcements for us this morning. Just tonight, um, we're continuing with our, our joint services with the other two churches. And tonight, it's in Sydney Methodist. We're moving away from St. Brendan's and we're down in Sydney Methodist tonight at 7 o'clock. So if you're free, please come to that. Just being reminded that the summer walks are still on. Um, they've, been, they've been going on every Friday night over the summer. And I think next Friday, this Friday coming now, we'll be in Beaver Forest. So um, speak to my dad or like Sam's, not, Sam's not on holiday still. So speak to Ted about that afterwards. Just remind everybody that the fun day is on this Saturday coming at 10 o'clock. Um, if you aren't looking after your activity or a table, please come down and show your support. Please come down. Tell family members, bring children and grandchildren with you. Um, and we can all have a great day today or that next Saturday. For those who are volunteering, we need to have a quick meeting after the service. So if we meet in the, in the, in the wee room afterwards for about five or ten minutes just to clarify all the roles and responsibilities and what we're doing. And I've just been informed this morning that apparently Mr. Larry, Eddie, is 80 tomorrow. Where is he? Is he out here? Is he out? He's still at the back. Eddie! Uh, 80 tomorrow, Eddie, is that right? 80 years young. Can we sing happy birthday to him? Yes. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to We're going to turn to God's Word this morning. We're going to read a couple of verses from Psalm 33. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, the starry host by the word of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord, let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded it, and it stood firm. God is our creator, our Lord, our savior, and he's our deliverer. He's worthy of our praise. So let's do that now. Let's stand as we sing, crown him with many crowns.
Let's turn to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we bow before you in prayer to acknowledge that you are the one true God, the creator of the heavens and the earth and of every living creature. Lord, we are amazed that in your love for us, when we strayed from your path, you sent your son Jesus to live on earth, to be a blueprint for our life. You sent him to be a sacrifice on our behalf, dying in our place and taking the punishment that we deserve. Lord, as we spend time together this morning, as we seek to learn about you and to worship you, we want to rejoice in your name, rejoice that you are the light of the world, and that to know Jesus is to know you. Lord, may we always be thankful for your grace and mercy to us, for your love and sacrifice. Amen. Kids are out this morning. It's time for you guys to go out and go to Sunday Pals. Everybody's rushing here away this morning. You guys want to stay, are you? That's fine. Good. We're going to stand and sing again. We're going to sing How Deep the Father's Love for Us. turn again to God's words, and we're going to read this morning from John, John's Gospel, and it's chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. The Word became flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life 
and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. <coughs> he himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Amen. And may God bless this reading to our hearts this morning. We're going to continue and we're going to pray again. Heavenly Father, as we come before you again in prayer, our hearts are burdened by many things about our lives, our jobs, our families, and all that goes on around us. We pray for a sense of calm in our lives, knowing that you oversee all things. We want to learn to trust in you more each day, to know that as we go about our daily routine, your spirit lives in us and through us, and in all things we want to glorify you. As a church, we seek your will for our lives this morning. As we reach out to those around this church, as we reach out with the good news of the gospel, we know that without your blessing, it would all be a waste of time. So we pray that we will follow where you lead and that our efforts in your name will see a great harvest. As we look around us, we may be despondent at all that goes on. Remind us that this is not how you intended the world to be when you first created it. Remind us that one day you will restore earth to its former glory when you return. As we continue this morning, teach us from your word. Open our eyes and hearts and minds to see you clearly and to want to love you more and more. Amen. And so before we turn to God's word, as before we come to look at these verses in John chapter 1, we're going to stand and sing again, O Word of God Incarnate.
I thought Danny wasn't going to be here this morning, so uh, he gave me free reign to preach on whatever I wanted. Um, so we're still on holiday, technically. Um, so I hope he enjoys himself. He's asked me to preach today and at the end of September, and I thought what I would do would look at a couple of passages from John. John is one of the earliest Gospels, and it's based on eyewitness testimony. John was there. And while we have four Gospels that tell the story of Jesus, John very clearly tells us that he has a purpose, a special purpose for his version of events. In chapter 20, verse 31, he says that these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John firmly believes that Jesus is alive and well, and that knowing him will change your life forever. As an example, just a couple of weeks ago, we heard from Martin Catro from Albania, and in his testimony to us, he told us that he'd been given John's gospel to read while he was in Greece, and how reading it had transformed his life, and he wanted to know more. When I'm out on a Saturday night in town or with, uh, down at the Odyssey with Nightlight, those of us who go out, if we have the opportunity to share words from the Bible, or if we have an officer need to give out um, a gospel, we usually use John's gospel to give out because it's very clear in its writing. So focusing in on the first chapter, John gives us, in the first 18 verses, a summary of Jesus' life and purpose, and which he then expands on in the rest of the gospel. He tells us that through Jesus, the world was created. He says that Jesus is with God. In other words, he is a distinct being. And Jesus is God. He is the same. He is divine. And then the word became flesh. Jesus became human and lived among us, among the people of the time, revealing God to them. He lived as a man, but never ceased to be eternal God, who has always existed, the creator and sustainer of all things, and the source of eternal life. Now we're going to look at these 18 verses just, just this morning, and I was chatting to Danny about this early in the week. He told me to use these 18 verses, and he preached 10 sermons. So I think, you know, this is a very brief summary of what Danny probably wanted to say. So what does John want to say about the word? John, in his writing, is writing to both Jew and Gentile. He's writing to everybody who wants to read, the, who read his gospel. For the Jew, they will recognize a lot of what he says because he's referring back to Genesis and the back to about creation. Um, they will recognize what he's referring to. In Genesis, God speaks words and things happen. And God said, let there be light, and so on. Um, and John calls Jesus the word. So he's being very clever here in his use of the writing. And for the non-Jew, who maybe doesn't understand any of this, or who doesn't have the history of, of that knowledge, he's stating an incredible fact about the beginning of the world. And he's challenging them to believe in Jesus and in God. In verses 2 and 3, we read that the word creates John says that the Word is God's own agent in creation. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. So if you are God's dependent creatures, then we are no less dependent creatures of the Word of Jesus. In verses 4 and 5, the Word gives us light and life. It says, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. Now, simply taken in the context of, of verses three, of verse three, sorry, John is helping us to understand light in terms of creation. Looking back to Genesis again, we read that the earth was in darkness, and then God said, "Let there be light." But if we read on then to verses six and eight, we hear about John the Baptist, who came as a witness to the light, so that through him all might believe. And this gives us another viewpoint to look at. It gives us an overtone of revelation or truth, light that reveals that which was hidden. Imagine yourself standing in a room with no windows and no light. In the pitch black, you can see absolutely nothing. You've no idea how, how big the room is or if there's anything in the room. And you don't, you don't move in case you either fall into a hole or chip over something that's there. But turn on the lights and all is revealed. Not only is the truth about the room revealed, its size and its contents, but those contents, by their placement, indicate a decorator. The room has been created to look like that. 
And so in the same way, John expresses the word as light in two ways, in terms of creation and in terms of revelation. And in verses 9 to 13, we read that the word confronts and divides us. In these verses, we read of two reactions to the word. For some, they did not recognize him as their creator, and they rejected him. While others received him, believed in him, and had the right to become children of God. Some people just loved darkness and shied away from the light because their actions were evil. While others lived by truth and stood in the light, stepped out into the light. I remember back to my old school days when teachers would actually physically punish you. You'd get a smack or something, you know. Um, something not allowed today. And unfortunately, I have to admit to receiving my fair share of punishment. Um, not for anything serious, but enough to merit a old cane across a hand on occasion. Now, being caught by the teacher was bad enough, but what, have been, what would have been far worse was a note home to mum. It was much better to get simply wrapped on the knuckles and move on, rather than mum knowing about what was going on in school. Isn't that right? <laughs> um, so yes, it was much better to do that, and I'm, I'm hoping that, that that doesn't mean I'm not getting lunch today. The simple fact is, we don't want to be found out. And John is reminding us that there are two ways to go, stay in darkness or step out into the light. So how is this light revealed to us? In verses 14 to 18, we read that the word becomes flesh. John tells us that the word who was with God at the start and is God is now living here on earth as both God and man. And I've got five, five short headings just to explain all of this. The first one is tabernacle. Now, I'm sure you'll understand what tabernacle is if you're looking back to the Old Testament. In verse 14, John says that Jesus, that the word made his dwelling among us. This is a completely new approach from God. Back in the Old Testament, right up to the point when Jesus came to earth, God could only be approached in the tabernacle, out in the desert, when the people, were, when the, the people of Israel were, were uh, wandering about for 40 years. And then finally then, in the temple, when Solomon built the temple, they could only worship God and go approach him in that way. Even in the earlier days before the tabernacle, when God dwelt on the mountaintop, the people had to stay at the bottom and couldn't even touch the foot of the mountain. So now, Jesus arrived and has literally become the tabernacle, the place where God dwells. And in the next chapter, John records Jesus talking about himself, he even says that. Destroy this temple and I will rise, raise it again in three days, he says. Our second heading is glory. Verse 14 continues, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father. Because God's glory is so immense, no one could approach him. Even Moses went in the desert. When he asked to see God, to be sure of his support, he was told to hide in the cleft of a rock. And as God walked past, he actually put his hand over the cleft of the rock and hid Moses from his sight. And Moses was only allowed to see God's back as he walked away. So, in continuance of this new approach, Jesus, the Word, shows God's glory to us in a way that is manageable and understandable. Paul, writing to the Philippians, tells us the same things. Talking about Jesus, in two, Philippians 2, verse 6, he says, Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Um, or in some verses it says, something to be used... Um, sorry, I forgot what the word is now. Um, sorry, I'll continue. Um, so something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by being obedient, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. I had quite an interesting conversation at work on Friday afternoon. Now, I'm not allowed to preach at work, I'm not allowed to tell people that they're going to hell or anything like that. But someone, if someone talks about religion or something about the world, you um, usually get the opportunity to say something about what you believe. I'm not sure how it started, but one girl was talking about the universe were there aliens and so on, and she wasn't too sure because, I mean, who else would build the pyramids, she said. She talked about reincarnation. She doesn't believe in that. But eventually she went on to talk about whether there was a God or not. And the usual questions about, well, if there's a God, what about all the suffering in the world? But she did say one thing that was, what was interesting was, if there is a God, um, she, she thought there was no way that our feeble minds could understand or grasp the nature of what God is. And I said to her, yeah, you're quite right, we can't. But the Bible says that Jesus lived on earth, displaying the Father's glory for us. 
in a manner that we have some kind of understanding, Jesus is there to show us what God looks like. Enough so we have to make a decision about whether to follow him or not. We can't sit on a fence and plead ignorance. A third title, or a third heading is full of grace and truth. So John continues in verse 14, telling us that the Son comes in grace and truth. Again, my conversation in work on Friday turned to the subject of good people, people who do tremendously good deeds all their lives. And they thought, well, surely they will go to heaven just because of what they do. But Ephesians 2, verse 8 says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. We know and understand that in our own strength and ability, nothing we can do can be enough to earn entry to the kingdom of heaven. It is only through God's grace that we can do so. His forgiveness of our sins is a gift that we can, what we cannot earn, but that he freely gives. And John very simply tells us that Jesus is here because of God's grace, and he displays that grace too. He tells us here in this introduction to the gospel, and later in chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus' own words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me, through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. And the, the fourth, top, fourth hiding is grace and law. Or as, um, as John put it, grace in place of grace already given. Again, comparing the Old Testament to the New. Before Christ, the law was given by God to his chosen people. Obey the law and all is well. But if you fail to obey the law, you have the opportunity to, to sacrifice, to atone for your sins. This is God's grace, the grace through the law. And God instructed his people to sacrifice animals. But here, now, through Jesus, in verses 16 and 17, we receive grace in place of grace already given. Grace through Jesus instead of grace through the law. No longer do we have to sacrifice because Jesus sacrifices himself once and for all. And number five, seeing God. In verse 18, we are reminded that no one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is God and reveals God to us. Remember back to Moses again? He couldn't see God's face for the glory was too much. He could only look at his back. And we won't see God's full glory until our own last day. But for now, what does God look like? Look to Jesus. Look to what Jesus or what John describes Jesus to us. Look at all the other Gospels as to how Jesus lives in the world at the time. This is our introduction to the book of John. But what does it all mean for us today? And... In these 18 verses, John summarizes who Jesus is for us. Christ has always existed with God. Christ is equal to God because he is God. Christ was involved in creation. Christ became a man in order to fulfill God's plan of salvation for all people. Christ did not just have the appearance of a man. He actually became human to identify with all our sins. And yet he still remained fully God. Christ voluntarily set aside his divine rights and privileges out of love for his Father. He came down out of heaven, that wonderful place to live here on earth, which was full of sin and corruption. And Christ died on the cross for our sins so that we wouldn't have to face eternal death. So in this introduction, Jesus' deity is revealed. Calling him the Word, John sets us up to read the rest of the Gospel. And unlike the others, this is not an Eamon Andrews' big red book of Jesus' life. It's a powerful argument for the incarnation, a conclusive demonstration that Jesus was and is the very heaven-sent Son of God and the only source of eternal life. I actually saw something interesting on Facebook this morning. There was a short video about how, how fine-tuned the universe is in order to allow life. And any minute change in what the scientists call, scientists call constants would destroy or prevent life forever occurring. If you follow me on Facebook or follow one of my friends, you can look up, because I posted it, and you can find it and you have a look at it. It's very, very interesting. And so I read the verses in, eight, in John, these 18 verses. I think it should be very encouraging to us as Christians. Here we have Jesus showing us what God is like. By trusting him, we can gain an understanding to God's message for us so that we can live for him every day. And if you don't know God because you don't know Jesus, let me encourage you this morning. Consider the witness of John. Consider these words. 
Consider his argument that only through trust in Jesus as the light of the world can you be truly saved. Step out of the darkness and enter the light. Amen. I'm going to continue our worship this morning with our offering. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, just thank you for your many blessings to us, Lord. We just pray, Lord, that as we give our offerings to you this morning, Lord, that you would use this, these, these, this money, Lord, to your glory, Lord, for your kingdom. Amen. We'll finish this morning by, by standing to sing, You're the Word of God the Father. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.
folks, just remind you folks that we're going to go meet in next door. Anybody who's helping out in the fun day. Thanks.